So, Alan, you've recently been putting the finishing touches to a new recording of solo guitar arrangements of music by Bach. Yep, yep. What's the fascination with Bach? Where does my fascination begin with Bach? Um, well, as many classical guitarists, I started out my life playing by popular styles of guitar. So in, um, back in Ireland, I was really fascinated with all of the whittly whittly guitar music. It's a technical term. And the fancy uh, stuff, you mean? Yeah, it's all the, the kind of heavy metal stuff, you know. And when I was about 12, I was walking downtown Belfast, home from school, and I stopped by a cassette store. You know, they used to have cassettes. And uh, I bought a Bach cassette. But the reason was it was actually recommended by one of these widdly widdly guitarists in the linear. Do you remember who that was? I think it was Vinnie Murr. This guy called Vinnie Murr, and, and it was like uh, he played like some version of Aaron the G string, like in a metal version. Yeah, metal version. Yeah. And he said uh, in his linear notes, he was like, "And thank you to J. S. Bach for all the inspiration." Right. And so I was like, "Who's this J. S. Bach guy?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I bought this um, tape of it was called Bach Concertos, which was a very kind of bargain bin kind of is it Brandenburg collection. Or? It, no, it, ha it, had, violin. it had the vi double violin concerto, which I, w I just instantly became kind of obsessed with. Um, and I tried to learn the stuff on my, by ear, you know, even though I couldn't really read on the guitar. And it had the Italian concerto, it had the uh, chromatic fantasy and fugue. That's not which a concerto. I, which I know, exactly. I think it was just kind of named flippantly by an executive. Um, and I, I fantasized about playing that on my electric guitar. Right. So, I, so I became obsessed with that sound, and, by, and then I bought the Brandenburg Concertos. And, you know, and, and so it kind of grew up with that parallel um, fascination with that. So that's interesting because I think for most guitarists, our experience with Bach, I mean, yeah, we would have heard some Bach in the background of our kind of musical lives, but it's usually the lute suites and that E minor bore or something that we first get hooked up Well, with. I did, I, um, right before when I forced myself to learn to read music again, when I was, I guess, 15 or so, I had the Julian Bream recording of the, the beret or the E minor suite, and I actually taught myself a version of that mm -hmm. by learning the top line and then learning the bottom line and putting them together. Right. Um, and that's, yeah, so that's, that's a big part of my... I think that's what Paul McCartney did, but it came <laughs> out as Blackbird. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this, this is different because uh, you got absorbed with Bach with the big stuff. Okay. The big yeah. pieces. Right. The pieces where he's really fully realizing his ideas yes. without much restriction because he has a lot of instruments available to, right. to elaborate. <laughs> ask you this, uh, the repertoire that you've been dealing with, most of it is known to guitarists already. Right. Violin, a bit of cello stuff, uh, a lute suite, uh, some of it less known and some of it less uh, dealt with by guitarists. But um, what you've come up with is quite different from what I've really experienced before in arrangements of this stuff for the guitar. Uh, in that you've added a lot of extra counterpoint and layers and orchestration almost in some cases. So guilty as <laughs> <laughs> so what was guilty as what, what, was there any kind of thinking behind that, or is it just what you heard and felt you, you it needed? Um, well, I guess there's different kinds of thinking. You know, there's thinking that's very intuitive. Well, intu that's kind of where I live. You know, if I'm writing songs or if I'm doing arranging things, um, and maybe kind of a type of problem-solving thinking as well. Um, but I, I didn't really leave the the station thinking about doing that. Um, the, some things just started to occur, I guess, with the Chacon 
maybe first, although even with the, the 996, the, the E minor suite. And why is that called the first lute suite, by the way? Because it's the first in the book that Brugger published. Oh, because the, there's a 995. Yeah, so it's just... I'm going to start uh, calling it the second lute suite. It's all just the order that he happened to put them in, and it's stuck. Okay. Why is it called a lute suite? Well, I get the... Right. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> With with that even when I recorded that a little bit earlier, and it definitely made a decision. I was like, well, if I'm going to do these repeats and these dance movements, I'm going to have to do ornamentation, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> and uh, so I did that quite freely, you know, kind of creatively, maybe more than some people would. And she even changed some things structurally on the repeats. Um, so I guess um, I always had that kind of, you know throw caution to the wind and kind of do something that's that's in that spirit of improvisation but in the Chacon um, things just kind of started to occur um, uh, almost of their own accord um, but starting with the I guess there's things that I was dissatisfied with you know when you hear things that have been recorded a lot so for instance the the arpeggio section at the end of the major section I was always like a little bit unconvinced of the things that people would do, and it sounded like they they weren't convinced of what you should do, you know. And so I started doing some things that my um, my hands kind of could afford and, and do and try things. And so there's a lot of experimentation, like physically, and uh, and then that seemed to kind of work. And then in this other section, something else would occur. It would kind of bring its own um, ideas to me, I guess, in, in that realm. So the kind of elaboration you're talking about with the first loot suite is really mainly adding discrete ornaments well, with some extra divisions and a bit of but that, like I might that. have gone beyond the pale with discretion. <laughs> View, well, yeah, listener but, discretion. But by discrete, I mean yeah. trills, mordants, pudgeturas, right, 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 this right. kind of thing. That's yeah. kind of almost a performance practice issue uh, to a certain extent. But with what the kind of uh, elaboration you've done of said of Chacon, this is a different thing. It's, I mean, yeah, sure, there's ornaments you've, you've put in there, but you're elaborating with counterpoint and not just elaborating by adding a few bass notes here and there, right? But you're adding internal voices and contrapuntal voices and upper, in cases, in some yeah, cases, yeah. upper contrapuntal yeah. voices as well. So, this is a very different approach to, to what we've, we've all uh, become used to with the guitar. We're basically filling out harmonies and adding bass notes here and there. Um, so you've taken a, that, that approach much further by adding complete lines and answering parts and voices throughout the entire texture of the thing. So what were you, would you, um, what Where led you, you your to ideas those? from? <laughs> <laughs> Me. <laughs> no, I do. I do get a lot of ideas. What were you hearing internally? What were you imagining internally as you're playing through this piece, and you, and you, your imagination is leading you to, I can hear a line that can go above this, or there needs to be a a, a, a line, an internal line. I guess you have like a kind of the the backdrop of all of the Bach you've listened to, just yeah. on a subconscious so level. So we're really going back um, to the idea that you first listened to these highly perhaps, elaborated yeah. concertos. Well, well, I have an idea of the kind of Bach, too, that some things remind me of. The Jacone seems to be definitely a, a real tour of, of the of various um, techniques that he used in certain almost, I hear certain things that are almost like concerto styles. I hear things that are, um, fantasy type things so in the arpeggio section I treat it more like the the cherished memories I have say with the chromatic fantasy and fugue with that arpeggio section which really touched me in a very like deep way not just the virtuosity but just the when Bach is in a realm of pure harmony he seems to be at his kind of happiest mm. you know he's not in the constraints of of just you know writing things for princes and you know he's in his world you know and so there's that element that I wanted to bring to the um, the arpeggio section I think and that started to develop its life of its own so but this type of thinking that you're dealing with it, it's almost like 
the same thing if I'm writing music. It's a definitely an alpha kind of flow state where I'm getting ideas, but they're, that are so instant and so kind of intuitive that they occur. I just, I just think that things occur to me. And so, but there's definitely certain sections where I feel like this is a brilliant um, kind of Italian style, like a violinistic, you know, and, and I feel like box Vivaldi type kind of fetish or whatever, you know, and, and I, there's other parts that this feels like St. John's Passion this yeah. part feels like it's part of the mass. And people so in several pieces, it's it sounds really like orchestration, right. like you're orchestrating. Well, obviously, as, as several people have done, um, Gustav Leonhardt even playing some of these things on his um, the harpsichord seemed to add things quite freely. Like yeah, but some of these things you do himself. sound to me very specifically uh, like trumpet parts, for example. Right, right. From a, a Brandenburg, Brandenburg concerto. Yeah, that's what. Well, the little, ch the famous cello prelude. That's just something that I hear. I can't give a, a great defense of it. It's only this is like the way I hear this. People hear it as like a linear kind of fantasy thing usually. Um, but I hear that piece is a very structured piece and is a very kind of concerto type, you know. Um, so when Bach repeats something, I hear it as like, well, if he could, this would be echoing mm -hmm. and um, being, uh, you know, kind of, sent in different directions. So. In all of these arrangements, you've added and extrapolated out the texture to meet something approaching the limits of, of the guitar. Not that it's um, not idiomatic, yeah. but you clearly using just about every resource you can, and not just in terms of uh, contrapuntal lines, basses, filling out chords, adding ornaments, but also in the actual uh, tessitura, the range of the instrument that you're using. Mm -hmm. So you're playing very often in very high positions, mm -hmm. as well as very uh, the lowest ones, which again is a, a different approach um, than what we're accustomed to, especially for myself, I just want to play everything in the lowest position possible with maximum open strings. Yeah. And if I have to fret a note, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. But, yeah. so this massive uh, three octaves that you're using all the time, really. You're talking about the, f the lute suite first? Well, the first lute suite, you play the opening passaggio an octave higher. Well, yeah, well, than, I, well, than, I, than, I worked off just the, Julian, do. the little Julian Bream book, you know, the mm -hmm. green book. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, when I see it, we're like, well, you got to detune down to D, you know, to me, I, I hate doing it. I can't imagine performing something like that and tuning in the middle of it. So I have my own kind of um, problem <laughs> with that. Just so, so I'm like, well, well, it starts on, I can start it on this B, why not? You know, and then, and then there's this idea that I had, it seems like beautiful idea to just almost like, bless the guitar all the way through itself. Do you know what I mean? Like f you the use the, yeah, it's like an exploration of the end. That opening passage is now an exploration of the entire range of the guitar. Right. some octave displacements. Yeah, I, and going I, back I like to avoid that if know. I can, and, and the guitar has, my guitar had a nice note up there, you know, some guitars don't work up there, but... Um, but it gives a very different uh, uh, additional sonority that we very rarely hear in, 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 uh, in any guitar pieces. Yes, there are some pieces that go up, up the neck every now and again, but you have entire sections. So I'm thinking of like, um, the, pr the, prelude, the, the first prelude from the first book of the Bell Tempered Clavier mm -hmm. sounds 
not like a guitar. It sounds like a harp. Okay. And I think if your eyes were closed, you would say, oh, that's a harp. That's a terrible harp player. <laughs> <laughs> it's a harp with uh, a very not very good sustain. No, but it, it, um, the sonority that you create with that is so uh, unique, really. Um, well, um, whenever you stumble upon some of those type of arrangements, it's you're kind of just lucky. It's it's like a luck thing or something, but you're ready for the luck because you can see the you know. So if I was dealing in the in the right key, so when I saw like the C minor one, for instance, that's how I got to the major one. Is like doing that in kind of A minor configurations with a capo. Let's talk about keys. So the key is kind of the key, you know. So, what key is your shakon in? Well, it, it, it's using E minor configurations, and I was, I started it in E minor, which which is actually the the origin of me attempting to do something with this. I, at first, like a long time ago, I had this idea I was just going to make a box CD, and I already knew the shakon. I played it since I was like 18, and I played the C major suite as well, and I didn't think about kind of adding things but I remember when I was studying with you you had this arrangement in E minor which I'd never heard of I was just being provocative even, though. even though it was I, I wouldn't have dreamt of actually playing it in concert <laughs> <laughs> and you were no I remember in, in a lesson you were trying to persuade me of it and I was like I'm trying, but it was probably just like I already knew it and and I didn't really see the the great value of it but ago, I'd say, I actually had a dream, a very lucid dream. You know, you have dreams, but then you have like dream dreams that, that seem to have, so whether or not they do, you know, some kind of import, you know. And so I had this dream where I was, I was really playing this in E minor, mm -hmm. like E minor shapes, and, 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 and I could see it, I could, it in my dream, like it was very clear. And I was at my in-laws' house, and I only had my steel string guitar because I was just going to write songs and stuff. And uh, I guess this is around the idea of me having like a revival in my classical kind of interest, you know. And uh, so I had this dream where I was playing, it was, and it was this dream full of light and full of like, you know, like an illuminated dream. It was like William Blake or something. And I woke up, and I had my guitar, and I was like, I you know, just those opening chords. I had to do it just to. I was like, "Yes, this is this is absurd to There's not no do this." There's no way to go back once you yes, play the opening four measures. Yes, it's absurd not to do this in, in E minor. minor. Yeah, no going and back. So I immediately, um, I was like, I emailed you and I was like, "Can you send me your, you know, your E minor version?" So and and, and so my idea was really just to do your version, <laughs> you know, and to um, unmolested, you know, and just kind of do it and. You've always got really good ideas, you know, how to do good campanella fingerings and stuff. So I thought this is the version I'm going to record and, and learn, and I started doing it. But as you know, when you start tinkering with things, you get ideas, and then you get, you know, bored, and you start adding things, and and you start to come to terms with your own ideas with it. Um, and so that was a long process, though. This was the, when I'm adding things to this. This is a matter of like years, you know. And there's versions of this which you've heard. Yes. It's, uh... Your process, I think, is organic. Really, yeah. it's not really pre-planned. You just play. And start and just hear things, yeah, and exactly. start figuring out what can I do with that yeah. idea I just heard. Yeah, it, what is, what is this asking for? And is then this asking some for fingering something else? has to be discovered. Yeah, and it has to, to, it has it to be something that the hands can afford. So I don't do things that. Aren't but also through the, the, hands. the, the son sonorous and not awkward. Right, right. Yeah. So I don't sit down with a pencil and. But, but I'm largely using things that Bach it was just common language for Bach, mostly imitation. And, and things, and if there's a motivic thing, it's it's usually derived from the or variation. Itself. Again, you know, I think the probably the the winning weapon here 
is that you've not made these arrangements based on any kind of theoretical idea, really. You know, I'll analyze the bass right, and just right. put the correct basses in. It's more, much more organic than that, and it's based on this long and deep listening to the kinds of Bach pieces that uh, perhaps guitarists don't listen to that much, or at least they don't listen to them with the idea that they can incorporate those ideas right, into right. violin music, cello music. Right, well, I, well I think sometimes people feel a little bit um, squeamish about touching something like Bach being obviously the the son of the. Well, musical. this is a big issue, but it's it's. But, a, but from that time period, it's it's a different thing. Well, it's just, it, it's just a, a sword with two edges. I mean, yeah. you, this is a, you know really uh, high level, important, deep music, and you don't want to mess with it. On the one hand, yes. But uh, if you don't, you do it. An injustice. Yeah, I, I feel, you, you, I feel you make like it if bad. You, don't, yeah. you make it sound worse. Oh, Any time Bach redid something, yeah, he, he would make it into a, an organ piece, or a violin piece, or a cello piece, or a lute piece, yeah. or a key, whatever it is, yeah. because that music has to be adjusted exactly. to speak properly exactly. on the instrument it's being played on. Exactly. And I like this quote. I think it's in the Forkel book from C.P. Bach, who said that when Bach played, he played unaccompanied violin music on the, uh, on, the, on the clavichord at home, adding whatever he wanted to by the way of harmony right, well, as, that's he, very as he felt. That's very comfortable. As he wanted to. <laughs> that's very comfortable. Because it would but be, there's a spirit of it, that. It would, in it the would Baroque, sound a little bit right. weird to play a yeah. cello suite prelude on a clavichord and, and just play yeah. the notes for the yeah, cello. Yeah, I, I don't like that. But and it's the same with the guitar. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a funny kind of almost Rosetta Stone um, experience I had because after doing giving the Chaconne the business and going all the way through it like that, I almost had your musical conscience is like when you're doing the, the, the thing that follows the Chaconne, which is kind of a, a related piece, you know, I think that they're related. And the C major sonata, which has the enormous fugue. Mm -hmm. I knew I knew all the music for this, but then I almost your musical conscience was like, Alan, you need to do this as yeah. well and this. Right. So I did it with the 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 obvious movements that are a bit more predictable, like the fugue and the uh, the largo and the allegro assai. I knew what to do with those. Those things occurred to me very easily. But the the first movement, the only movement, yeah, yeah, the adagio is so kind of strange. And you know, there's a lot of diminished harmony. That it's it would be difficult for me to easily add things that were correct. So then I discovered, largely through just the reality of YouTube these days and the algorithms, when you listen to these things, the Netherlands Bach Society is always putting out the, the complete works of Bach eventually. And there was a, a harpsichord is playing an arrangement that Bach had made of that adagio. Which was like this problem solved for me, you know. What I mean? <laughs> yeah. But it was the difference between that and the violin one was insane. It's massive. Yeah. It was like completely different. It's so whole other piece. So it's like in terms of uh, it was a confirmation of sorts that, that like yeah Bach would have done. I think of Bach as being his the the core of his creativity is is like he's like an ambassador for the eternal or the infinite, and and his music could go out. Like if, even if he had more than um, if he had like a Via Lobos choir, and the orchestra, he would keep going. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Into the universe. So with that Rosetta Stone of the Adagio, it was like it's like yeah, you're all right. You, you, you added a few things. This is okay. This is good. This is appropriate. Um, and then I was able to he put it in G from C to G, and which is also a confirmation. You get these weird confirmation of. Keys, we can see what Bach actually did with some things. Well, there's a lot of the tessitura. There's always been a lot of talk about the rhetorical meaning of keys, right? And all that. You know, we play in a different pitch now. Even. Exactly, exactly. But and who knows what pitch people were playing in right. in different it's places Probably like back a, then. at least a whole step. But lower. the fact of the matter is that when Bach arranged something pre-existing for some other instrument, he almost always changed the key. Right. Because exactly. he has to find the right key for the instrument. Right, it's like a man so singing a woman's song. It, song. Yeah, yeah, you play a, yeah. you know, a violin, a cello, a flute. They have a certain range. Well, yeah. your keyboard has a different range. 
Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. You know. Well, I had a very strange but moment. It, but it, but it, questions, it brings into question this idea of key symbolism. Now, there is a certain yeah. degree of key symbolism. Yes. But Bach was also a very practical yeah. composer. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And not too f I don't think he was too fussy about things like that. I don't think of it as a fussy, it's not like, you think of Chopin, right, as being the ultimate kind of fussy composer mm. who's going to get everything perfect. And it's like, well, if you're going to mess around with this, you know, on the guitar, you know, you got to get the exact right effect at least, you know. But ba the, the spirit of the Baroque is a different thing even than Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven to me. And it's, and it's, and it's much less, it's much more like a, a jazz musician or something. But... The thing is with the Chaconne, which is funny, like, because uh, I like to play like Dyland stuff, Doland, and, mm -hmm. um, and I really enjoy when you put the capo on, and it has this sonority, right? And so one time I put the capo on with the Chaconne, and it was me. It's some things more difficult than the higher things, but. It was like this capo on the second fret sounds really, really, you're like right. I recorded you know. my cello suites with a capo. Right, right. So there's something happening. Then I thought, oh no, perhaps people are going to think I speeded them up. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but to me, when you do that with a guitar, it kind of becomes a broke instrument. On it some changes. Level. Yeah. It changes the overtones. Exactly. The, the, yeah. So when I put it on this particular place in the second fret, like F sharp minor or Baroque G minor, which is kind of like the St. John's Passion key, G minor, and, and maybe the most used Baroque minor key is what you would say. It's good enough violin. It's up there, it's up there. And, yeah. but then I heard, when I, once I had done this, I stumbled upon um, Gustav Leonhardt playing his Chaconne arrangement, and I was like, is he playing this in F sharp minor? No. <laughs> so I was playing G minor, right? And he, re he arranged it down into G minor to the sonority, and I was like, this is exactly the same sonority as this harpsichord G minor mm. Baroque sound. And, it, and there's just something that seemed very right about it. And, and maybe that's where some of the type of St. John's driving bass figures that I hear co even comes from the key, I don't know. Mm. kinds of music and I don't think that any of them are correct right they're just different approaches yeah they can be done well can be done not so well um, what this capo does in combination with certain fingering systems yeah for both hands it creates a a new kind of instrument. You know, you'd like to call it the Baroque guitar, but you can't because there's already an instrument There's, that we refer to as the, the Baroque guitar. Yeah, right. It's not that. It's a modern guitar, but it's like a metaphysical yeah. Baroque guitar. Exactly. It's a different version exactly. of, its, uh, of itself. It's a different and instrument. Yeah. We have all the campanellas and the trills yeah. that we can do on strings or off strings, a slurring. We can do longer strings, stretches because the frets are small. Yeah, and um, yeah, with the capo you have more possibilities in the lower positions. Yeah, exactly. Because you can reach further. And this different overtone set. And it's a different instrument. It's, I mean, it's like Leo Brower's harp guitar. Exactly. It's a different version of the modern guitar. Exactly. It's not the Villa Lobos guitar. And it's not the Segovia guitar. I don't know about the, the, the Leo Brower Well, just harp. the way he does lots of that, That's what I, over I think of like the essence, the, the guitar is a technological harp. That's what I think of it as, you know. Yeah, it, it became a violin for a while, didn't it? Right, right. Uh, and so this idea that you play a long string. string and, and Which is a, a, a very yeah. nice effect. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I love, like, those it's, Christopher Parkening records and, yeah, and Segovia. It's something that works really yeah. well for, you know, yeah. primarily melodic music. Yeah. For sure. But it's this kind of uh, inconsistent... Yeah. Uh, Consistently inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. world of, of yeah. strange sonorities. Well, so, well, the notes that, die so quickly. We can so afford intriguing. we can afford those overlaps. Um, yeah. well, to, to me, it's also in the realm of what 
pianist just called Good Cantabile playing, where there's a very slight overlap, over legato, you yeah. know, over sure. legato, and the notes are so autumnal on the guitar, they're dying. That it's interesting to me, the piano, and you can listen to really fine players playing things like the Debussy Preludes, mm -hmm. and lots of those notes have got staccatos on them. Yeah. And for a pianist in that repertoire, it seems a staccato is just barely, is a, it's like a, a legato, uh, just, a, right. just about oh, a legato. Yeah. yeah, it's like a legato on the guitar. <laughs> and it's like a slur and on a the A legato guitar. Is, a, is, a, is a slight campanella to us, you know. Yeah. Yeah. On this recording, you've arranged uh, unaccompanied violin music, uh, an unaccompanied cello prelude, um, some keyboard music, and right. also a chorale prelude. Um, do you perceive differences in those in those pieces uh, in terms of you know the being written originally for different instruments? Is there something distinctive about that? Um, no, I mean. I just think of Bach as kind of like a, a language that you get a, a son, an ear for. I mean, maybe the keyboard music would inform the things that I would do with the other stuff. Obviously, with some, you're, it's a matter of reduction. So in the C minor prelude, I'm not playing the big cadenza part in parallel sixths or whatever. I'm mm -hmm. just picking the higher one and mm -hmm. doing it because I think that's what Bach would have wanted. And it's sinus. It would be ridiculous to try well, the other thing. You can never know what he wanted. So it's wanted. reduction, a matter of reduction. But it sounds good, right? And uh, and then with the the other stuff, it's expansion. You're, you're bringing it. So, but with it almost sounds crude, or maybe it'll sound insulting to some people. But if I'm messing around with, say, like the cello prelude, I just keep doing things that occur to me until it sounds like Bach. Right. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, sure. Maybe in a more expanded version. So, I guess there's a couple of ways to think about this um, in terms of these unaccompanied pieces, especially the cello pieces. But, um, you know, it's Bach's idea. Now, the, you know, Bach has a, a, an invention. Uh, he invents He's an a opening kernel. thing. Yeah. And, that, DNA. and then it gets yeah. discussed and, yeah. and, and uh, worked out and resolved. So that, I think, is independent of anything. That's just the, the invention is just some notes. Yeah, the pattern. But um, there's no such thing as an unaccompanied cello genre. I mean, there are some unaccompanied cello pieces from the Baroque period, but it's not mm -hmm. exactly a major genre that other instruments right. or composers could have copied anomaly, right? or, or developed. It was, yeah. you know, obviously he was writing for some specific person or reason. Right, right. But, uh, there's an idea we could take, say, the, the first cello suite prelude is pretty much the simplest thing Bach could ever have written. Yeah. It's in C major. Uh, it's not a very... It's G, G major. Sorry, G major, oh, no, in my yeah. version. <laughs> yeah. It's well, for the G guitar, major. it, it should it's be something like that. It's in G major, it's in G major, sorry, yeah. Uh, which is a straightforward key Yeah. for the cello. It doesn't need a lot of crazy fingerings. It's not a piece with a lot of dissonance in it, really. I mean, there are some moments, but um, it's a fairly straightforward, innocent piece, relatively speaking, for Bach. Now, if you imagine Bach playing that himself on a keyboard, let's say the clavichord at home, he would have added more to it. He would have done more to make it yeah. into a... Mm -hmm. Without making... Well, I, I don't know, but I would imagine he wouldn't have gone... Nothing to grotesque. ...really crazy with it, right, you know. Right. And if he was doing it on the organ, yeah, he would have gone in church. Eyes, you'd yeah. get even more, yeah, yeah, more counterpoint, more lines, yeah. you know. Then the idea could also be spent with an orchestra. So the idea is that this the cello version is a very basic version that can be elaborated out depending on what instrument, yeah, or instrument you're gonna. Yeah, but but use that, it that's for. what I was saying in terms of him being fussy or not fussy. Like I don't think he was like Chopin, where it's like this is the. Right, but the, 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 the same issue applies with the violin, but it's less obvious because you can do four note chords on the violin and, and even do good voice leading, yeah, you know, yeah. things like that. But I just think sometimes I, I think, well, is all this music really keyboard music that he has, in a sense, reduced down 
right. to something that those instruments can handle. And right. then when we're playing it on a harmonic instrument, we have to bring it back to what he would have done, the kind of thing he would have done. For me, I just, arranging music, I mean, you know, I always have the same premise. I just imagine that Bach, Albanith, whoever it was, was writing that piece on the guitar themselves. Yeah. What, what is a reasonable guess at what they might have yeah. done? How, how difficult would they have made it? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, how far would they have gone? How, you know, they wouldn't deliberately want to make it awkward unless there was some con contrapuntal imperative, right. like the art right. of fugue or something. Right. But um, yeah, it's just uh, another way of looking at it that... That depends on the player The, 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 the cello kind of, suites, yeah. the violin suites are actually or reductions of something he had in mind. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard to say that without it sounding insulting. Well, it, and it's just the, it's not a yeah, it's a not a or literal concept. I mean, it, you know, yeah. it's, it, it's just another way of looking at it. Exactly, exactly. And I understand people who just want to play the notes that are written and stuff. Yeah, and I totally get that. That I, I do as well. You just can't, but you just can't pretend that this is the correct way to do it. Exactly. That's the only thing. Exactly, that and that's me. what I mean when I was doing the C major thing. It was almost an issue of musical conscience. Like, oh, you can't just leave this the way that it, you, you know, because you've done this other thing and it seemed to be the right imperative to follow um, on a gut level. And that's where I work from. So it might be wrong, it might be, but that's where I'm working from. It's like an instinct that seems to pay off and it seems to bring baggage, it seems to bring inspiration, it seems to bring like a turbine of ideas. And so I follow that. And you know wherever it kind of leads. Let me ask you about this then. But I test it. I say, well, what do you think of this? You know, like when I showed you, I was afraid when I showed you some of the Chacon stuff that you would just, you know, vomit in the sink and, <laughs> and leave immediately. You know, but um, no, well, you, have a but good you were very encouraging. Well, you have a good ear. Well, I mean, that's how you write music yeah. by ear. You yeah. can have all kinds of. Mathematical processes yeah, ahead and, of it or underneath it, but well, in that the boils other side, down to does the, it sound good or not? Yeah, the reality of the music. Yeah. How does it feel? What does it say? Box music is like nature itself to me. Well, it's, so yeah, let me ask you about that. So. so, do you have any? Um, relatively literal ideas about what some of this music is actually about? I, d I definitely have like uh, instincts like um, like to, for to me like the Saraband for instance which I played the famous wrong Julian Bream note <laughs> which you were I didn't know was wrong until you there's an F natural in there instead of an F sharp so there's like this diminished chord but when I hear the Saraband of that it's such a profound um, deep piece of music. I almost have this instinct like there was a death of a child or something. There's something very deep going on. And he's not just cranking this one out in the Bach machine. That there's something very personal. And I don't know if that makes it a romantic piece. <laughs> um, but it makes those terms irrelevant. But then there's the obviously a, there's a trope with the Chacon that that makes a lot of sense that when you know he came back and discovered his his first wife uh, Maria had died when he was on a trip with some prince. Um, he, he kind of wrote the Chacon that seems to be this aberration at the end of a normal dance partita that has is longer than the whole partita the other pieces put together. Um, so I think I think it's a terrible argument to to try and kind of dismiss that that it's such a, a gargantuous you know outpouring and, and it has a lot of um, very, I, I, uh, when I was younger, I used to think of it because it has that the, the basic chromatic descending kind of partimenti thing going on. That this is the, the way of the cross kind mm -hmm. of type of partimenti, right? Um, that the descending chromatic line. And so that I always just took it to be like a religious symbolism and, and a kind of a passion, like a miniature passion almost in a miniature cathedral. Um, I, that's how I thought of the Chacon, and and I still hold to that. But now I think of it as kind of in parallel with his wife um, dying, and then as you get more and more entrenched 
and it, you'll, you'll stand up sounding like a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> but but wh how I hear the Chacon, it like if he ended it in the first minor section. I was just going to mention it, this. It, it would. You were okay. Go ahead. No, go on. Oh, yeah. To me, it would still be the greatest piece of instrumental music ever written. Right. Even if he had ended it there, and I feel like he did end it there, so at well, first. Yeah, I, I agree. And and when I that cadence kind of the idea that that it always annoyed me this is what my point is it it annoyed me musically when people would end that and then just go bling da -da, you know and start the major thing like that seems wrong to yeah, me yeah they're almost like separate you're right three separate movements almost right but connected of course but 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 this idea occurred to me when i'm talking about these intuitive ideas this idea occurred to me when cuz i like those kind of um, you know those floral kind of florid cadences you know that that good baroque players do lutenists do harpsichords do there's a lot of suspension and they play it out you know and when i did that at the end of it instead of just doing those octaves it seemed like that major chord was just this inevitable ending you know this picardy third way, yeah right? so you made a connection exactly like this is over through a suspension right yeah. and 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 if you and if we three. get into this weird uh, maybe then some of the numerological aspects of it if he had have ended it there it would have been 33 variations right. which gives you the kind of the life of christ but also the 33 years of his first wife oh wow who died also when she was 33 right and I know Bach, you don't have to be a great mathematical genius to do th things like that, but maybe to naturally do it in your music you do. And so the, the idea of this reluctant uh, major section kind of appearing um, in a spectral fashion, I think, uh, in this kind of transcendent, you know, uh, calling, starting gently, and then, you know, where, he, where he's going through all of the, the dark human emotions, all of the, the, you know, despondency, all of the uh, anger, and then to have this still this kind of little ember of hope to, that gets blown on and it goes through its own well, major ascendance. I think you're right that the piece is finished and done complete. Yeah, at 33 variations. It's done. But he, he wasn't done yet. Right. <laughs> but that's what I mean. But I think he was surprised. But the piece was. Yeah. But he saw it, then he, he goes on. I think he was surprised. And he, he, has and he more continued to, he has like more, reluctantly, so more that's to how say I on this see topic. it. Yeah, yeah, that's how I see it, and I see it as as an answer. And and there's there's that element of rhetoric that we see in music. Like for instance, there's a funny story when I was in, at the chiropractor, right? And I noticed this when I was in the little waiting room, and you're getting your you know back iced, ready to go in, and it's supposed to be calm, right? So. You, they, they play this music and they had this kind of like classical CD playing and it was Bach's uh, famous slow movement of the F major concerto, the Italian. keyboard concerto, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, oh no, the, the, no, the concerto, sure. You know, right. the one that Hey Jude gets taken from. So that was playing, but what happened was that there wasn't the the rhetorical answer. They they didn't play the next section where the rhetorical doubt comes in. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where where the idea gets kind of tested with a counter argument, mm -hmm. and and so I, that's what I see in the Chacon when it goes into that major. It, well, well, let's let's counter this argument with with hope. Like what do I believe? You know, there's. So I don't know if that's something that came through him or came to him, but he but he argues it out in this upward kind of ceremony that that ends up in trumpets, right? Mm -hmm. And it ends up in the the most whatever the opposite of the, the initial emotions are of despondency, of anger, of frustration, of passion, you know, of, of suffering, and it, and, it, and it draws it on a thread through the seven heavens or whatever and you get to this very you know and that's partly why i wanted to do the, the arpeggio section in a very florid way too just for the dramatic effect and then i feel like when he's done with that then he's kind of you know like 
like John the Revelator, he's kind of thrown back to earth, you know, and the, the ground. And, and, and then the, that next chord that begin, begins the last, you know, quarter of the, the piece or whatever, in my, it's not even a minor chord. It's an inverted major chord, you know, that six chord. It's a flat six chord. Right. So, and then I, so I added, the, well, the lower third there too, you know. So it's, that's even ambiguous because then he's dealing with like, well, here's life, here I am, you know. Um, and so, it, and then you have the big fanfare that, that, that ends it. But he's also, and then that leads to the title, say solo that he called the sonatas and partitas, mm -hmm. meaning obviously six alone, four violin, six solo. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also that, that um, which I read about, I didn't discover it or anything, but just the, this Italian rhetoric that, that also means I am, you are alone. Mm. I mean, you are alone. So it adds to this trope about the wife dying and that he's somehow encompassing or he's, He's kind of uh, distilling her memory in these pieces mysteriously in this beautiful small format, um, like a I don't know, like monks who would draw on the inside of you know pot, you know, for only for the eyes of God kind of thing. So it adds to that story. Um, you are alone, um, and so the ending of the Jacon to me comes to that realization. I have. You know, these five children or six children, and, and he survived. On, ends on one single solitary. Yeah, right. Isolated. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, it, but it's also, it, it shows you that the, I don't know if the Chacon's in the golden mean area of the whole se sequence of pieces, mm. um, but it's obviously like this kind of black opal of, of the, the, the center of it as it unfurls into these other things. And, and it also grows into the next pieces naturally. So, when it grows into the adagio, this ambiguous kind of uh, tolling bell, I think of it as a gothic cathedral. It's him, that's the world he's in, and he's, and he's grasping for some kind of hope. And then what you have is in the ensuing fugue, which is his longest fugue, mm -hmm. this big monstrous 12 minute thing, it's almost a counterpoint to the chaconne structurally because what happens is it has the same uh, counter subject, which is the descending chromatic, you know, thing, the way of the cross type thing. Lamentation. Lamentation. Yeah. And then he bizarrely inverts the whole thing mm -hmm. halfway through, mm -hmm. and it becomes an ascending chromatic um, thing of, of hope. And then you have that beautiful Largo, which has this tender kind of mother to a child kind of thing that we sense maybe in the air of you know, G-string or some of his choral preludes, which is just so full of love and full of um, compassion. And then you have the Allegro Assai, which I see, how I derive the, the kind of additions to that is by hearing his treatment of the famous E major violin prelude in the symphonia right. for yes. organ, right? So I hear the things, dun, 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 you know, the little organ things and, and how he brings it alive. And and what what came to me, and I don't know if I'm right or not, this is all instinct, this is all, you know, conjecture, is that he, he did that allegro assai, which has a lot of play with the open strings these kind of pattern things that are very violinistic and, and to me he just he's in this place of joy and rejoicing to where it gets to a point where he's like I'm really enjoying this I'm really but you know what would be great if this was actually an E because I'd have that high E string and then to me so so they have the Allegro Assai it seems inextricably linked to the preludio of the E major one, which hmm. is the next one, right? So he ends that one, and he's like, "Let's keep this party going, guys. You know, <laughs> pour me some more scotch." And it's like, dee -da -dee 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 -dee. and it's the same music. It's the same music. It's an E, which is even more triumphant rhetorically, right? It's maybe the most is it the brightest kind of Baroque choice in affectations. I think D. I'm not sure D, really. D, e I always felt a D being bright. 
because of the, what yeah. it sounds like with an orchestra. So, but, um, so then obviously that we're in a, a, a when we get to that last that, that partita last, that last is, is of re rejoicing. It starts in a very high starts in a very high register. And the the yeah. cantata that it's used in as the beginning is it, it's called "We thank the Lord our God." You right. know, so it, there's there's a rhetorical and there's a rhetorical thing with the fugue too, which is um, also bleeds into this parallel uh, story of Christ and the the uh, you know the crucifixion and perhaps the resurrection, maybe the hope for his wife in the resurrection, but but the fugue is a Lutheran hymn, right? That's like, come Holy Spirit, come. And so there's this whole kind of parallel thing you could draw from a post-passion kind of, you know, Book of Acts kind of dispensation of the Holy Spirit or something like that, theologically. So I find that very fascinating. And I'm a preacher's kid, you know, and I grew up with that kind of knowledge of things like that. So the, it's it's just very fascinating, and it's also fascinating to have religious music that I, that is not detestable. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like. It's to me, it's spiritual music. It's spiritual music, exactly, and uh, and so I, you know, it's just music I have a very deep affinity for. I just love it, and that's what the basis of it is: just love. Thank you. 